Hello, welcome to my March wrap up. And before I get into the books that I read, I'll first talk about the highlight of the year for me so far. And that was the wonderful trip I got to go on to Orlando, where I got to meet some of my great friends on booktube in real life, including Alan at the Library of Alexandria, his beautiful wife, Christina, Jimmy from the Fantasy Network, Philip Chase, AP Canavan of A Critical Dragon, and my favorite author, Steven Erickson. So this was such a special trip for multiple reasons. We got to celebrate Alan's 40th birthday. Getting to meet all of these wonderful people in person was just such a delight. They are all just as wonderful, if not more wonderful in person than on screen. It's just something special to get to be in the presence of people that you care about so much. And I have to say that Alan is every bit as funny in real life as he is on screen. Of course, he doesn't have access to all the gifts and sound effects, but he makes up for it with his energy. Christina is just like a real life Disney princess, as you can imagine. And Jimmy is every bit as gregarious and warm hearted and just such a lovely person, as you can imagine. Also, Philip Chase is the real deal. What a kind and warm person. He even went around the table. My husband was with me and he asked my husband and Christina, what's it like to be married to a booktuber? <laughs> it was really sweet of him. He was just so lovely. And then I loved getting to know AP in person. He's obviously brilliant, but he's also much taller than Philip, as we learned and had haircut. And he was also so welcoming because the IFCA conference, which was why they were there, I came just the last day to say hi to everyone, but I really feel like the IFCA conference is AP's game. You know, that's his thing. And he was just so warm and welcoming. They all were so warm and welcoming. And Steven Erickson, what a kind, gentle person. I just enjoyed his presence so much. I was so honored to sit next to him at breakfast and I was way starstruck. If you couldn't tell from the video that Philip posted, I think I stared at him like a hair too long, but I just, I really appreciated talking to him and it was special that I was reading The God Is Not Willing during that time. So I got to talk about Stillwater, this wonderful assassin mage character who he said just came off the page when he was writing her. And it just was so wonderful to get to talk to him and be in his presence. And I felt kind of sad when it was all over because I just felt like there were so many things I could have talked about or brought up and I just couldn't do it. I just felt like I had to let go and just be in the moment. And um, in a way, it was just kind of sad when it was all over because I didn't want the morning to end. That was the biggest highlight of the year for me so far. Honestly, I just really adore all those people and can't say enough good things about all of them and couldn't be more thrilled to share that here. So that was the big highlight. And then from there here, I'm gonna talk about the books that I read in the month of March. I did read Wizard and Glass by Stephen King, which is the fourth book in the Dark Tower series. I do have a video out for that. It is spoiler free um, for the most part. And I considered doing a spoiler discussion on the book, but decided against it in case I wanna maybe do a collab someday perhaps, or I don't know. I, I just decided against it. I guess I just wasn't sure how much interest there would be in spoilers for Dark Tower books, but let me know if that's something you would be interested in in the future. And then from there, I also picked up a couple of other short reads. So after finishing Wizard and Glass, I picked up the manga, the, the Vinland Saga manga, the fourth one. And I've been really enjoying my time with that manga so far. It's a Viking inspired manga. And it actually brings up some really interesting themes and questions now and then. In fact, there was a really interesting exploration on love as death or death as love that was brought up in this third one that I thought was interesting. And I also really love the way that the author breaks the third wall in each of these volumes. And he talks about certain questions that come up for him when he's thinking about the Vikings and wondering what the Vikings would have thought about modern day civilization or how they handle this sort of feature of daily life or what they thought about at night, that kind of thing. And I just love that. I love those questions that he brings up. And I know I'm making it sound like this is a deep contemplative type of manga again, but it's really not that. There's also a brief glossary at the back, towards the back of each of these volumes that 
explain certain words that are introduced throughout the manga. So very, very fun, fun read. Great palate cleanser. I'm borrowing these through interlibrary loan, so they do take a while to get to me, but I do need to put a hold in for the fourth book because I really have been enjoying my time so far. And then another story that I picked up between Vinland Saga and my next book was The Comet by W.E.B. Du Bois, which I'll explain why here in a minute. But this came on my radar thanks to the channel Fit to be Read. Michael is just fantastic. Please check his channel out. He recently did the 25 questions tag that I tagged him for. And I just love that video so much. So please watch it because he has the most beautiful family ever and wonderful photos and memories in that particular video. But in any case, Michael talked about his top 10 short stories in sci-fi because that's what his channel is about. It's all about sci-fi. And he brought up The Comet by W.E.B. Du Bois as one of his top 10. And I thought this is perfect because I was between books and I specifically wanted to pick up something by W.E.B. Du Bois. And I'm so glad I read it. Now, this was written in 1920. It's about a comet hitting New York City. Not going to say anything more than that because you need to read it just going in blind and I loved it. It hits pretty hard and highlights some very important themes, especially ones that W.E.B. Du Bois was known for bringing up. W.E.B. Du Bois, if you don't know, he was the first African American to get a PhD at Harvard University in the early part of the 20th century. So a very well-known scholar and I really appreciated just, I really appreciated that story. Please check it out if that interests you because again, it's very short, just a few pages long. It's more a soft sci-fi. It's not like a hard sci-fi at all. It's more sci-fi to illustrate important themes and ideas. And it's, I think a really, I, it's something I would highly recommend checking out. That's all I can say. But it was very important for me to pick up something by this author. And I really wanna read more from W.E.B. Du Bois because the next book I'm gonna talk about that I read in the month of March is The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now this book by Jeffers is unapologetically a black feminist book. And even though W.E.B. Du Bois's name is in the title and this author was highly influenced by a lot of his works, this is actually the story about a young girl named Ailey Garfield and her family. And it has a dual timeline. It is a very interesting. Uh, historical fiction book actually and we have these love songs that are like interludes interspersed within the text that go back to the slave trade in Georgia back to Ailey's ancestors and you see how how racism morphs during this time you see the racism of not only black people and the slave trade but also of the indigenous cultures in Georgia the creek people and you see how these things that have happened in to her ancestral past have played a role in some of the traumas that she and her family have endured and a lot of the Georgia by the way locations take place in a fictional town called Chickasetta Georgia which actually happens to be apparently a reference to Edenton, Georgia, which is actually not terribly far from where I live. So the funny thing about this is that I buddy read this with Brittany from Books with Brittany, beautiful, wonderful Brittany, who's awesome and definitely check out her channel. She's been more interested in books outside of sci-fi and fantasy lately. And when I watched Sean from the channel Travel Through Stories do a video analysis of this, a lot of the things he talked about made me think of her. And so I gifted this book to her. I took a risk and I gifted this to her for her birthday. And we decided to buddy read it together. And I felt like it was kind of interesting that I ended up gifting this book to Brittany thinking, oh, I think she might like it. But I felt like this really resonated with me specifically because I live in Georgia and I'm not from Georgia. I moved here about 10 years ago and I've always kind of felt a little like an outsider here. But learning about black communities in Georgia, even when I moved here, was an important thing for me to learn about. And I felt like I got a whole more in-depth perspective by reading this book, especially as it relates to feminism in the black community. This book deals with, of course, the dual timeline perspective, but also Ailey's perspective and her family and um, it deals with colorism. And although there is racism in this book, 
I think that part relates a little bit more to the historical past in this book than it does to um, the modern day life that Ailey is living in this book. And that's weird to say that. And I also watched a wonderful interview with, with, uh, with Jeffers on this book. And she talks about that a little bit because the thing that W.E.B. Du Bois is known for is this concept called double consciousness. And I'm just going to go ahead and read um, a quote from this really quickly. So double consciousness, that sense of paradox and tension which characterizes the black experience in a racist society, the African-American is the permanent outsider in U.S. democracy, an oppressed member of the household, perhaps, but never a member of the national family. I have been in the world, Du Bois reflected, but not of it. So the idea of double consciousness is the idea that there is always the constant awareness of the white gaze on you as a person of color, that you're seeing yourself through the eyes of being a black person, but also through the eyes of being a black person through a white person's perspective, therefore leading to a sense of double consciousness. I think if I'm explain, I think I'm explaining that right, but the quote probably explains that better than I'm explaining it. But what's interesting and what Jeffers explained in an interview, and I can't help but agree, is that this isn't so much about double consciousness in that sense, because from Ailey's perspective, we're getting much more of an in-depth view of Ailey's identity through black communities rather than her identity through the, the white gaze. So this is giving you an in-depth perspective of her identity through her interactions with her family and what family means and some of the traumas and the challenges and the hardships that she and her family have endured. But I think that the idea is that the problem doesn't start with the family in the present, it starts in the past. And so she's really trying to show you how things have evolved from the beginning through the racism, through the slave trade. So that's why you get these love songs interspersed and Again, it does touch on a, actually a ton of themes, including addiction and um, sexual abuse and just so many different aspects. But I think one thing that I really love about this book is just, I just love the family drama. I love the family dynamics. I love the characters. I did listen to the majority of this on audio. I want to go ahead and share that. And Brittany did as well. And I have to say, it is one of the best audiobooks I have ever listened to. I could not stop listening to it. And I've been saying that I recommend this book to fans of Kindred very specifically because in Kindred, it is a time travel story in Octavia Butler's Kindred where we see Dana's present and how her ancestral past also affects her in present day. I think that the time travel component is really just there to highlight that aspect and how racism kind of still comes back to haunt us in insidious ways. I think the themes are very similar, especially in the sense of, of ancestral pasts, of generational trauma, of um, interracial uh, couples. And so I think that that's all there. But what's very different about this book versus Kindred, which of course Kindred is a sci-fi kind of genre bending book. This is more just truly historical fiction and touches much more on feminist issues in black societies again. Uh, another big difference though, is that Dana in Kindred is I would say, although very smart, she is a survivor and she's intelligent. I think of her as a little bit more of a quiet character. Whereas Ailey Garfield is a very sassy character. Actually all the, all the women in this book, all the men, all the all the characters in this book are so vivid and so they have so much personality and so i kind of feel like you get a lot more of the dr drama just so much more richness as far as that's concerned in this book versus kindred though i love kindred and i appreciate both books for different reasons but if you want something that has a much more dramatic more of that than and more of a deeper exploration of even more themes and specifically black feminism then i would highly recommend this book though of course i always highly recommend kindred as well because i think what it did especially for the time it was written was pretty remarkable. I know that Brittany and I, we had so many discussions back and forth. We just messaged each other quite a bit while reading it because there is just so much to discuss and there's no way I'm covering even a fraction of it in this wrap up. But if this interests you at all, please do not hesitate to pick it up because 
I got so much out of this book. It gave me such a deep, impactful experience. And I know that Brittany has talked in her videos about how it gave her a book hangover and she has been wanting to find another book like it since. So don't hesitate, even though it is a long book, I highly recommend checking it out. And if you want an even more thorough analysis review, I would recommend checking out Travel Through Stories, Sean's video, because that was the video that made me initially interested in this book. And I love what he says, I think a couple of times in the video about how Jeffers interrogates the history of a nation through the perspective of one character and her family, something along those lines. It was such a good quote. I should have probably written it down, but he is fantastic and I really enjoyed what he had to say. So uh, definitely check out that analysis video and check out the interview. I'm going to link, link below in which Jeffers talks about this book and how it evolved and what it meant to her because it's such a great story. She's fabulous. I would definitely read another book by her. I was so impressed. Next book I read in the month of March was The God Is Not Willing by Steven Erickson. And I was reading this actually while I took that trip to Orlando. It took me a little bit longer to read this particular book than I was expecting. And I think um, even though it's half the size of a typical Malazan book, it still has pretty small font. Um, but it does read much like modern fantasy. I was told that and I definitely agree. And I was talking about this a little bit with Steven Erickson, and he said that, yes, that he felt as though with the 10 book series, that that was where the heavy lifting was happened. And so this was something where he was a little more free to just kind of let go, I guess, in that sense. And it's still very heavy with the themes, though. It's still very Ericksonian, I think is the term people like to use. We touch on some racism and addiction, loyalty, what it means to be a friend and to be of service. And I, I just really actually got kind of emotional towards the end of this book because of the, some of the friendships and the relationships that were formed. And one thing I should mention is that Erickson gave me a female friendship in an adult fantasy book. So I'm always asking for that. I'm always asking, can I please have a good female friendship in an adult fantasy book? Because I think we get a lot of them in young adult, but not so much in adult. And so I finally got one. I really loved the one in this particular book. And I really enjoyed a lot of the characters. Now this does pick up with a lot of storylines from House of Chains in the 10 book series. And it does have spoilers for Toll the Hounds. Um, I think there might be mild spoilers for Return of the Crimson Guard. Maybe not. Maybe I just, it was just because of some confusing conversations I had with a friend about that. But in any case, this was a very enjoyable read. Fantastic characters and world building and just interesting magic and amazing themes wonderful questions explored. So I am being very vague here because I very much look forward to having a wonderful in-depth discussion with Jimmy and Alan. And so if you want to hear my thoughts on that, I will let you know as soon as we set a date. I think Alan still needs to read this, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing his thoughts. And I know Jimmy loved this as well. So that promises to be a wonderful, exciting conversation because I think there's a lot to explore here. Looking forward to that. And other books I read in the month of March. While reading The God Is Not Willing, I also picked up the audiobook of Salem's Lot by Stephen King. And I picked this up because I am enjoying the Dark Tower series, as I mentioned. And I've been told that there are spoilers for Salem's Lot in The Wolves of the Kala, which is book five. Now I do want to read the 4.5 book in between now and then, but I thought I'd go ahead and pick up Salem's Lot on audio, which is a horror book, a little outside my comfort zone, but I really enjoyed it actually. So the thing about Salem's Lot is that uh, there's a wonderful forward if you read that at the beginning of the book in which Stephen King talks about how he was inspired by Bram Stoker's Dracula, which he read at a very young age as a kid and then later taught the book in a fantasy and sci-fi course he taught. He taught a high school fantasy sci-fi course, I guess, for a couple of years. He found a newfound appreciation for the book at that level, as well as all the EC comics that he read as a kid of these gory vampires. And he talked about how his mother would call all the stuff trash 
And unfortunately, she died right before the publication of Salem's Lot. And he says that he would like to think that she would have considered that book um, maybe at least not bad trash, I think is how he put it. But what's interesting about this particular book, and especially as you sort of contrast it from Bram Stoker's Dracula, and I haven't read Bram Stoker's Dracula, I'm so sorry, I feel like I should have at this point. But one thing that's interesting about that is the setting. So whereas Bram Stoker's Dracula, from what I understand, takes place in England and in Transylvania, I think there are two settings there. This particular setting for Salem's Lot takes place in a New England town in 1975, and he does date it. So when you start the story, it starts off, I think, in September 1975. So it is kind of dated, but I think it's perfect that he did that because if he didn't give a specific date and time to the story, then I think it would be really awkward and weird to read it now and try, it would have just aged more. Whereas because it was very specific to that time, I don't know, it seemed to make more sense for me personally. Now referring back to the setting, one thing I think he did really well in this story is it's not really about specific characters as much as I think it is about the town, Jerusalem's Lot, otherwise known as Salem's Lot, and what happens to it. And in typical King fashion, he does tell you at the very beginning of the story, basically what happens. <laughs> and you sort of kind of go back in time and understand how we get there. Like I said, although it's about a town and a real small town, America, it breaks up a lot of the problems in the town and sort of the crooked people in the town. And I felt as though the characters felt like world building for the town and sort of the creepy evil that takes over. And especially with this particular manor, which looms over the city. And I really love the way that this whole city just comes to life, the geography, the people, the culture, and just the disturbing aspects of human nature that come out. And also some really interesting conversations in this book about religion and how the religious battle is fought, good versus evil, and how that plays out in a 1970s small town setting. I guess I could, I'll put it that way. I can't really say modern as much because the book is continuing to age as we move forward. But I, I thought it was very well done. I guess I'll just say that. And I was creeped out. And I'm curious to see how this book apparently gets spoiled for me when I read On in the Dark Tower. There was one other audiobook I squeezed into the month of March after Salem's Lot, and that was The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And I'm so glad I got to this. I got to this mostly because it was kind of recommended to me when I did my time travel recommendations video. Of course, it's a classic. I feel like, who am I to say I like time travel stories and I haven't read The Time Machine. And so I did listen to the audiobook version, like I said, and I enjoyed it. I actually thought this would be a great, this would be a great story to have in a class or to study in a class because I think that H.G. Wells did a fantastic job bringing up certain ideas and themes and taking the future and sort of getting ideas of the future and sort of spinning them out and what would happen if we took the ideas of current society or at least a society at the time he wrote it and just kept spiraling them out and how would that affect human evolution. There are a lot of interesting ideas about technology, about privilege, a lot of symbols. And I also thought it was interesting the way it was told. And actually I felt, I feel like even though this whole entire story is about the possibilities for humanity, if we don't learn our lessons from the past, or if we just allow things to keep going in a certain direction and social class issues and things of that nature. One thing that I felt about the story is that it was very much about the time traveler. I felt like the story was more about the time traveler in a way than it was about the time machine. Overall, great story. Glad I got to it. It didn't leave the deepest emotional impact on me, but it was something that I definitely had to think about for a while after finishing and that I really appreciated. I really appreciated this story on an intellectual level and it's a very short one. So if you're somebody who likes ideas in your stories or you wanna read some good classical sci-fi, definitely check out The Time Machine, highly recommend for that reason. That wraps up all the books I read in March. As I mentioned in my April TBR, I did start An End to Sorrow by Michael R. Fletcher, the third book in the Obsidian Path series, which I'll be talking about in my next wrap up. 
But one other thing I want to mention is that while I was in Orlando, I happened to go to the IFCA bookstore there and I found a $3 copy of To Ride Hell's Chasm by Jenny Wirtz, a signed copy. So that was a gem of a finding and this is an author I really, really want to get to at some point. I've heard fabulous things about her writing and I found out that unfortunately I missed getting to meet her in person. She was there I think a day or two before me. So I'm sad that I didn't get to meet her, but an older gentleman approached the table and picked up my copy I just bought. And that gentleman happened to be Stephen Donaldson, the author of the Thomas Covenant series. And so I introduced myself and he was so, so, so nice. He said he read this book and loved it. What a treat to get to meet an author like uh, Stephen Donaldson in addition to Stephen Erickson. So wonderful to meet such wonderful people. What a wonderful month. And I'm just sad that it was so short, but uh, that wraps up my March. Let me know your thoughts on any of these books I mentioned in the comment section below, if you've read any of them, if you're planning to read any of them, or just stop by and say hi. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.